Christians called to be culture warriors. It, it is that time of the year where we have a bunch of people taking our culture over. How do we respond to anti-Christian, unbiblical sentiments in the culture? I want to go to Genesis 127 and 128 for you and talk a little bit about what the Bible actually tells us we're to do. I think you might be a little surprised. Genesis chapter 1 says, For God created mankind in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. All right, so I, I think you've probably read this particular passage before. It has a lot to say to us, especially during Pride Month and some of the stuff that's going on out there in our culture. It has a lot to say about the nature of human beings. It has a lot to say about gender. It has a lot to say about marriage. Certainly, the Bible explains that there are only two genders, that God created people, male and female. Certainly, the Bible shows us that God, not people, created the institution of marriage, and only God can define what marriage is. Only a marriage, only a union between a man and a woman is actually productive for society, has the potential to bear fruit, bring that next generation into the world. And it's only within that union that you can actually see the design of God to express and understand what true love is between a husband and and a wife. This beautiful illustration that we see, which actually represents Christ and his church, his people. Genesis chapter 1, of course, has lots to say about that stuff. I don't want to really get into all of that. I think a lot of that is obvious. I want to talk about culture, because it's something that goes unsaid often when we talk about Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Why is it that Christians are actually supposed to engage culture? Why is it? Well, it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Why is it that Christians are actually required? We're actually called by God to speak to cultural issues. You know, if you are one of those Christians who likes to speak to things, of course, demonstrating the character of Christ to those around you, you're actually fulfilling God's calling. Don't listen to the haters and don't listen to the people that, you know, say, hey, Christians aren't so supposed to speak to this. Yes, we are. In fact, that's what we learn from the scripture passage that we, we just read. When it says God created man in his own image, and the God created people, male and female, the idea is that God spreads his image across the whole world. That was the point. People are his image bearers. So as God's image bearers, God is now, he's, now he says, go be fruitful and multiply. So what are we doing when we multiply? We're actually spreading God's image over the, uh, over the whole earth. And, and, and so, you know, God's original vision, I guess, for the church, which will be fulfilled one day in Christ. It's not like God had a plan B. It's not like God's plans, ultimate plans, are going to be thwarted in some way. His original plan was to fill the earth with his, with his image, with his glory, with people who are demonstrating his character to the world. That will be realized in the new heavens and the new earth. And it is realized through his church in this age. So this is God's, this is why he created the earth. If you want to know the why behind the what, God created people because he wanted us to be his representatives. And, and so, and, and there's, there's certain criteria that go along with that. There's certain expectations that God put on us. So when the fall took place, when our first parents sinned in the garden, and every time you and I sin, we are perpetuating an ungodly image in the world. So this was God's purpose. It was for this purpose that God created them male and female. And then he says to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And then he uses this word, subdue it. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind when we're talking about Genesis and origins it's, it's that the fall dramatically changed, basically, reality as we know it. The fall, when mankind fall, it, it had a cosmic effect. It, it affected the animals. It affected the plant life. That's why we see death and decay. That's why there's volcanoes now. That's why there's death in the world. And it's why we have every negative thing. That's why there's cancer. That's why there, it all goes back to the fall. What does that mean? It means that we are to create culture. We are to speak to culture. Christians are to define 
culture, and we may not understand this in our culture today in a modern day America because of a what I would say is a misguided understanding, a misguided historical of the idea of separation of church and state, which isn't really a biblical idea in the way that we're presenting it today, as though a government or an institution should be completely secular. God doesn't have the same lines that we do. In fact, what you see originally in the garden, the scripture that I just pointed out to you, it, it, it shows us that God actually does have a requirement of people, and he wants us to be kings and priests in our society. I think that's what's going on there right in the beginning of the book of Genesis. You see this idea that, that mankind is to subdue the creation, and we are to spread God's image everywhere. That shouldn't just be confined to our churches on Sunday morning, but it means that, that this actually supersedes what we understand as a church building and you know what we do there on Sunday mornings. It goes out into the laws that we have. Our laws should glorify God. Our, our things that we do, our, our businesses should glorify God. These are requirements that, that God has on all of mankind. These are the things that God is calling Christians. He's calling, he's calling his people to fulfill. So but if you look at Genesis chapter 2, you actually see another creation account. It says, cultivate the ground. And the idea there of cultivating, it's actually, we actually, in the English, it's the same word as culture. It's, it's this idea to create, to not just be farmers, but to cre- create culture. Anything that human beings do, anything, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's music, whether it's the arts, whether it's government, whether it's a society, any, anything that people do should, we should be God's image bearers. And I'm just going to ask you this, like, what's your take when you look into culture? Do, do you see God's image on Netflix? I mean, you know, if you had to throw like a, a percentage on it, like what percentage of Netflix is God's image? And just do that with everything, every, everything, every sort of like, you know, social media app that we're on. What percentage of it is God's image? God's requirement is that it's all his image and one day it will be his image. But in the meantime, God does absolutely expect us as Christians to speak to and to subdue all of the creation. Culture is part of that creation. God expects us to subdue all of it. Now, I'm going to take you to another scripture. I'm going to show you this connection with Genesis chapter 1. It's the Great Commission. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go disciple the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. This is an important one. A lot of Christians look to this verse and they think, oh, this is, uh, this is Jesus just telling us to go out and share the gospel, preach the gospel. Go, baptize, teach. These are the participles if you're an English person. And, and you disciple by going, by baptizing and teaching, by evangelizing, by you know, baptizing, bringing people into the, the family of God, and then by teaching them. You know, these are, this is the discipleship process. But he, this verse is connected to Genesis chapter 1. And I don't remember if I said this when I started, but Genesis chapter 1 is also referred to as the cultural mandate. So basically, you know, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. This is referred to as the cultural mandate theologically. And the reason that it is, is because what theologians understand is that this is more than just a, hey, go be farmers and have babies. And so now you have, you know, Jesus, we fast forward to him. What is Jesus telling us when he says, go disciple the nations? And the Greek verb there for for disciple, I'm giving you a literal translation when I say that, because a lot of our modern translations just say, go make disciples of the nations. Of And we get the picture there that we're just, we're just supposed to witness to a few people you know, we're just supposed to, before we die, we're supposed to not be afraid to say the name of Jesus, and some of them will believe, and so on. This is a, the, the Great Commission is the Christian conquest of the nations. That's really what it is. It's, it's the reclaiming of the nations that were lost to sin in the beginning and, and false worship. A lot of those things we see trying to, to reassert themselves today. What the Great Commission actually is, it's an affirmation of the cultural mandate in the beginning, because we have King Jesus the Lord God who gave the cultural mandate in Genesis, who created the world, because we know that the world was created through Christ. We have him coming to his creation, cloaking himself in flesh, and now saying, now go disciple the nations. Go teach the nations my character. Go out, baptize them, bring them into the family. world, a divided nation today. Jesus is the only one who can do it. He's the only one who's really, truly, actively working 
on the division problem. It's Jesus that broke down the dividing wall. It's Jesus that gave us the cultural mandate, the commission to go out. That's what we're doing when we disciple the nations. When we think about Pride Month going on right now and, and how a lot of Christians get flack for pushing into the culture, some church leaders don't even want to address this kind of stuff. Some, some of them you know, teach just flat out unbiblical <laughs> ideologies about it, but others don't want to address it because oftentimes, and look, I've been a pastor for 24 years this year, <laughs> but a lot of times we're afraid we're going to lose our flock. We're afraid we're going to offend somebody. You know, may, maybe some of us are afraid they're going to take our tax exempt status away. But but God actually calls us to engage the culture, and and that's really what I wanted to show you scripturally this morning. If we're not engaging the culture as Christians and thinking big about Jesus' mission, about your mission, because you're in Christ. If you're not thinking big about your mission, Christian. Just slap your name in there right now. Whatever your name is, you have a mission. It's called the Great Commission. And you are called to subdue cultures. You're called to subdue civilizations. How can you watch your community or your nation be given over to ideologies that are ungodly, that that value and uplift a culture of death, that mar God's image in the world, that take people's freedoms the true freedom that they might have in Christ away from them that are coming after our children. How can you watch your community around you, especially in a day and age where you have the ability to speak to it? At least in theory, we still live in a free culture where we're able to practice religion the way we feel God leading us. In this culture of all cultures that was established with that idea, why would you not preach the gospel? Christian. Do you really love those who are around you and perishing? What about your kids and your grandkids? What about them? What kind of culture are they going to be raised in? You don't think Christians are supposed to be culture warriors? We're supposed to be the greatest culture warriors there are. In the Old Testament, they, they took swords and they went and conquered the land and that was what they did. And I'm not telling you to go pick up a sword today, <laughs> I'm, but I'm, I'm saying, for heaven's sake, don't be afraid to speak the truth to somebody, especially if you're in leadership. Because sometimes, honestly, we can be the worst, all right? Because we're we're so afraid of offending somebody that they might not come back to church next week, that we're sending the rest of our congregation to hell because we're not speaking the truth. And honestly, I, I think that's happening in our culture. Back to our original question, are Christians called to be culture warriors. I've got some application points for you here, and this is the first one I want you to think about, but you know, just, just answer this question for yourself. Do you believe it's your job to define culture? We just talked about how the cultural mandate, Genesis chapter 1, and the Great Commission, let's just let's tag Matthew 28 in there as well, and, and all the other versions of the Great Commission that we have. And let's, let's tag them all, all in there. Is it your job to define culture? Well, again, like, does Genesis chapter one, is, is this just a command to go be farmers and have babies? Is that all Genesis chapter one? No, it's, it's a lot more than that. And I think that understanding of it shows that, yes, it is your job. If you're hearing this and you're a believer, it is your job to speak to your legislature. It's your job. It is your job to define culture. I just showed you this biblically, okay? You know, if, if you want to look, what, what did Jesus say? Well, Jesus wrote the whole Bible because he's God, right? But, but Jesus actually said, go disciple the nations. How can you disciple the nations if you don't say anything? If you don't preach, if you're not sharing the gospel with people, how are you doing? It, it is your job. It absolutely is your job. Question number two, what do you think Genesis 1 and Jesus' great commission say about God's expectations on human society? You know, this, this is a great one here, you know. I, I like the, the way the Westminster Catechism says it. There's it's this, this old catechism from back in the day, from like, you know, 400 years ago. Presbyterians, Reformed folk, you know, you know what I'm talking about. The Westminster Confession says, man's ch- our purpose, our man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So it's this idea of being God's image bearers and to enjoy that relationship that we have with the Lord. When you're walking in God's commands— then you have God's joy. And so, like, again, getting back to the question, what does the Great Commission in Genesis chapter 1 say about God's expectations on human society? Well, he has them. God has expectations for human society. And if we're not meeting those expectations, look what happened to Israel. Israel was chastised, and they were given ungodly pagans would come in and rule over them when they weren't being obedient to the Lord. And eventually the land was taken away. 
on at least two instances that we know of. What will God do in the kingdom age now when a nation that once honored and worshiped God doesn't worship him anymore and turns back to all the false gods of our pagan ancestors, what what will he do? I'll let you answer that question. See, the Great Commission is discipling a culture, a society to honor and love God. That's, that's really what it is. Then finally, just this, and I, I think I want you to personalize this a little bit, but how can you stand up for your family and God in your community. I, I think of all the ages of civilization that we've seen, you know, to, you go back to the days of the Roman Empire and Christians were, were horribly persecuted. They're persecuted in other parts of the world today. But in the West, where Christianity has defined our lives, our civilization, <laughs> and, and the freedoms that we know in America, these things have been defined by a Christian culture. These people built the laws of our land around the laws of Moses. That's why when you go to the Supreme Court today and you look up You see this little tapestry of Moses up there. That's what they saw themselves as doing. We have that requirement placed on us to speak to culture. God has absolutely, when he's the the term culture warrior, fine. He's, He's called us to speak, to engage culture. He's called us to define culture as Christians. If you're not defining culture and your church is just trying to like convert people but not you, you don't see the place of that in, a, in the larger context of the community, then you're being unbiblical. You're not truly fulfilling God's commands. And I'm calling on you today to start to think about how your church can give to the community in that way by helping to define it, try to help the community to keep from becoming a place where it's not safe to practice Christianity one day. Because a lot of times you look out there, it seems like that's where we're going. And I know that we're not going there because the church doesn't have the power. It's just because the church often values convenience and comfort over submission to Christ. Christ is calling you to obedience. He has requirements on us. I think we saw that today, and I want you to just think on those things. Let's try to take this little part of the world over for Christ. Let's try to take our communities over for Christ. This is what the ancient Christians were doing. You know, they they weren't just trying to win a convert, you win enough con- converts, you got an army. And I, I, I think that, that's, that should be the mentality, to be honest with you. I mean, that's what we are. We're the Lord's army. We're his holy warriors in the world. God has made you a soldier. That's why Paul said to put on the full armor of God. I just want to encourage you today to do that. I hope that was helpful looking at Genesis 1. Maybe something you haven't heard before. Definitely something to think about. Why you absolutely should engage prayerfully, thoughtfully, you know, seek counsel from your, your pastor, your, your church, most of all from the Word of God, but, but, but do engage. Not only do you have God's permission, you have God's expectation that that's what you're supposed to be doing. So if you're not, then why not? God bless you, friends, and I will see you in the next video. Later. Hey guys, Pastor AJ here, and thanks for visiting my channel. If you don't mind, I'm going to take just a sec to tell you about Gospel Ministries and our mission to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. If you want, you can pick up some of our merch in our YouTube store to help you communicate that same gospel message. And I'd love it if you would consider subscribing to this channel so that we can challenge your Christian walk through solid biblical teaching as it applies to culture and other issues. In addition to that, you can go to PastorAJ.com where you can consider partnering with this ministry and and sign up for my weekly email newsletter. Don't forget, I'm on all other social media platforms at Pastor AJ Platt. One other item that might interest you has to do with a topic that I've studied pretty extensively. It's my book, End Times Mission, that will give you a solid education on the different views of eschatology and, more importantly, your role in Jesus' kingdom while we wait for his return. This book covers the historical origins of popular end times teachings as it guides the reader to Christ's current reign in a post-millennial worldview. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to know that you know Jesus. So if you'd like to, leave a comment or send me a message so that I can help you do just that because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes.